All right. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Cannabis Unlocked. I'm here with a familiar face, uh, Mr. David Culver. Um, David's been a friend of mine and key for a while now. This is, I think, maybe your third time joining the podcast, David. Um, so super exciting to have you here. Um, obviously, a lot's changed um, since the last time we spoke, probably about a year ago, um, not only with the industry, but with your career as well. So um, maybe for those folks who are tuning in for the first time, um, David would love for you to give yourself a little bit of background on yourself. Um, last time we were on the show, you were uh, heading up government relations at Canopy Growth. Um, I know that you've now uh, switched over to working at the US um, CC. So would love for you to give folks a little bit of your background and, um, you know, talk to me a little bit about the transition and how it's been and what you guys are up to at USCC. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me again. It's uh, great to be with you. And uh, thanks for all the good work that, that you've been doing in the, in the cannabis <laughs> space, uh, since we last spoke. Um, so lots of excitement. I think I should just start with that before I, I get into me. Um, I am uh, as excited about cannabis reform issues uh, uh, right now, more so than I ever have been. And uh, I've been at this uh, for about six years uh, in, in the cannabis space, and I think 2024 is going to be a special year for us. And we can get into all those uh, thoughts that I have around the the, the reform efforts in Washington. But um, last time I was on, I was with uh, Canopy Growth, and I was running their global government relations. Um, but unfortunately, uh, me and my entire team uh, were a victim of um, the big layoff that Canopy had uh, in April of last year. And um, you know, the, the business is just, it's a tough business. And, uh, you know, Canopy has a lot of really, really smart people uh, around the globe that was work, that were working internally, um, trying to make things work. And, um, you know, the, the environment that we are in, in the cannabis space, not just here in the U.S., but globally is a tough one. Uh, and so they, they've had, they had to make some really hard decisions last year. And unfortunately, you know, that did impact me, but I was very lucky in that um, right away, I was able to step into a role with the U.S. Cannabis Council, and um, it, you know we represent over 80% of the uh, operators here in the United States, um, and you know many of these companies have been investing uh, significantly in the government relations space uh, for some time now, and uh, I think that their their work is, is starting to is going to start to pay off here uh, in, in the near future. And it took longer than we would have thought, but I think it's about to to pay off. Um, USCC uh, is um, in a really good uh, financial spot right now. Uh, we are starting to think about what we're going to be doing um, uh, for you know later this year as a trade group and how we're going to you know launch into our phase two. Um, but we're really excited about the work that we've been doing and obviously grateful to our members. If folks are out there and you're not a part of the U.S. Cannabis Council, please reach out directly to me. We'd love to have you, uh, whether you're large, medium, or small. Um, and we really need your voice engaged politically, and you can absolutely do it through the trade group. Um, I should also mention that uh, we have launched a super PAC, Tibby, which is, which is cool. Um, this is the first of its kind in the cannabis space. Uh, these things are expensive to, to build and to launch. Um, and they also, uh, you know, take time in terms of the fundraising, but uh, we've gone through, we've gotten through that initial development period, and um, we're excited about what the Super PAC is going to do in 2024 going into this election cycle. Um, we also are getting ready to launch uh, nationwide uh, with a number of companies uh, in dispensaries, uh, a roundup campaign that is going to be directly benefit, uh, benefiting uh, the U.S. Cannabis Council. So, um, we, you know, for those of you that follow us on social media, uh, please, please pay, pay close attention. And if you are a consumer and you're buying at one of the stores where we're launching the Roundup, um, please make sure you round up your, your extra cents, uh, because that's going directly to the political work that, that we're doing. Um, and uh, I think it's going to really be impactful. It's, it's the first time that the, uh, the cannabis consumer is really able to directly help us fund our, our political work versus going through. Wonderful. Yeah. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where things are. Yeah, that's super helpful. So uh, just a couple of things to unpack there. Um, what's the easiest way for folks to reach out to you and get and get in touch if they wanted to? Yeah, so uh, me directly, uh, dculver at uscc.org. Uh, you can also go to uscc.org and uh, you can click on our um, membership page and we can send you all the information that, that folks would like. But uh, I, I really do encourage people to reach out directly to me. 
Um, I always love to hear from folks in the space. And, and again, we need as many voices as we possibly can uh, to get all this reform work that we're doing this Congress over the hump. All right. Well, you guys heard it here yourselves. Um, please reach out to David if you've got a any questions, if you'd like to figure out how you can help um, and be a voice there. And then with regards to the Super PAC, um, same thing, going to USCC, or is there a separate website? Yeah, no, so it's uh, legalizeamerica.org. Uh, folks should uh, absolutely go and check that out. Um, we have a number of really exciting promotions that uh, we are getting ready to launch, and um, including one at the Super Bowl that'll be in February. Um, we have, uh, the Super PAC is, is unique because uh, we're really able to use uh, two sources of funding in order to, to put that to work. Um, and the first source is uh, email campaigns and also peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. So um, folks are accustomed to getting these and, and we've uh, had some really good initial success uh, in terms of the fundraising efforts there. Uh, the second is the Roundup campaign. So um, that money is gonna go directly into the US Cannabis Council, but as a trade association and specifically a C4, this is way in the weeds here, but uh, we can actually <laughs> transfer um, roughly 40% of our overall budget into the super PAC um, and, and really use it for just general electioneering. So it doesn't have to go in the super PAC, but our electioneering expenses needs need to be about 40%. And that's what we're gonna do with it. So um, we haven't uh, established ourselves in the States yet, but that's something that we're talking about, uh, really trying to tackle some commercial issues in the States that have, that have been popping up. Um, we also would like to engage in some of the ballot initiative states that we're going to see in 2024, like Florida. Uh, and then, of course, we've got just your general politics of Washington uh, and how we can use that super PAC to engage with uh, elected officials here in D.C. So anyway, uh, a very, very exciting uh, political tool that we have built. Um, and uh, watch us closely to your audience, uh, because I think we're going to have some really exciting things, in, especially in Q2 this year. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. You guys are putting in work that previously had not been done and I think was desperately needed in in the industry and, and frankly, a step that could not be skipped with uh, the reform that we're expecting this year, which I think is a, a really great transition here. Um, unless there's anything else you want to talk about with USCC, I, I'd love to get your thoughts around safe banking, rescheduling, all this exciting reform. Um, anyone who's had their ear to the ground this year has seen that there's been almost daily headlines with regards to cannabis reform this year. Um, we feel very, very positive um, that something will happen. Um, but who better than an expert like yourself to uh, to kind of give us the download here? So maybe we'll start with safe and, and what you're thinking there and, and move on to rescheduling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, like I said at the outset, uh, I am very, very optimistic, uh, more so than I ever have been. Uh, about cannabis reform efforts. And, and you hit on the two major ones, uh, the Safe Banking Act uh, and also scheduling reform. So we'll start with SAFE. Um, the Safe Banking Act uh, last year, when we received commitment from the Senate, uh, the chairman of the Senate Banking um, Committee to hold a hearing on this, uh, that was really the, the uh, an enormously significant uh, step in the right direction in terms of getting this bill to where it is right now. And the chairman went ahead and held a hearing and then, of course, as you know, um, he also had a markup uh, that followed later uh, in the summer. And um, that markup, uh, then the, the members were able to vote on it and get it out of committee. So um, the bill has, for all intents and purposes, gone through a regular order in the U.S. Senate. And it's been the intention all along for, for that package to initiate in the Senate versus the House, because the House, as you know, has passed it seven times. Uh, and they keep punting it to the Senate, and it's died. So... Now they flipped it on its head saying, we're going to start in the Senate and we're going to move it to the House. Um, and that was the plan. Now, things got a little held up, as you may recall, last year. And it was mostly because of uh, Section 10 within the Safe Banking Act. And this mm -hmm. is anti-choke point language. Um, and Congress um, has been wrestling with this for quite some time. But this actually goes back to 2017. This was Representative Luktemeyer's language that he put in to help um, <clears throat> Uh, bring Republicans in into the safe banking discussion and give them more comfort, which it, he absolutely succeeded. Uh, the Senate then, as they were getting ready for markup, changed the choke point language, and they didn't vet it with the House. Uh, and so now they've spent the last number of months um, really going back and forth between House and Senate negotiators, trying to find that 
middle ground where everybody's comfortable. And I think mm -hmm. we're very, very close. In fact, I know we're very close on that. And so All right. they're at the point now where they're talking about words and not talking about sentences or themes. Um, and so I think once Section 10 gets sorted out, then I think the bill is going to be ready to move. And the big question that we all had at the beginning of the year was, how is it going to move? Because the, the strategy from last year was that get it out of markup, put it on the floor, uh, potentially amend it with other uh, cannabis reform items. Uh, we talked about the HOPE Act. We talked about the Graham Act. We talked about a number of things. Um, but I think the strategy now has changed to where uh, they have agreement uh, amongst the four leaders of the House and the Senate. So uh, this is leadership in the in the House, leadership in the Senate, um, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, that this this is something that if there were a broader package that's going to move, which there will be a number of them in Q1, Q2, that the Safe Banking Act could hitch a ride if it's in this skinny version and if that choke point language is sorted out. So um, that's the plan. And, uh, you know, I, there's a number of bills, not just funding bills, uh, that we're going to see in February, March, and April uh, that are must pass for Congress. Uh, and I think there's a good shot that the Safe Banking Act uh, it's just a ride. Um, wow. And then, and then I also think that um, if that is the case, uh, there I, I think we absolutely could still see reform efforts uh, come to the floor at some point later this year. But, um, you know, the politics really get in the way, the 2024 politics really get in the way of congressional action um, starting, you know, Q2, Q3. So yep. uh, we're hopeful that they uh, they move the banking bill along sooner rather than later. And, uh uh, we're we're in a better spot than we ever have been, uh, and I think the strategy that leadership has has laid out to get this done is spot on. Yep, that's super interesting, David, because I know that um, you know, we've tried kind of hitching the wagon to other bills in the past, and and that's failed. Um, I think it was uh, Mitch McConnell a couple years ago who basically said like this needs to go through standalone, um, which is was my understanding last year, which was what they were trying to push. So. Now you're talking about hitching it to another wagon again. How has sentiment changed across um, members of Congress or, or, or the Senate there with regards to a standalone versus, you know, hitching it to another spending bill? Sure. Great question. Uh, well, the answer, and this is way in the weeds here, but the answer is that the bill in the U.S. Senate has gone through regular order. So because they had a Senate banking committee hearing, because they had a Senate markup, uh, at the banking committee and the bill was voted out of committee uh, and it passed out of committee and it was a bipartisan vote. Um, that was really what Leader McConnell had issue with. Got it. In the, the last Congress, you know, he said to the Democrats, you all had the majority in both the House and the Senate. You could have moved this bill through regular order and you chose not to. Uh, and as a result, uh, my members haven't had a chance to weigh in on this and I'm not uh, comfortable putting it into a, you know, end of year spending package. So, now that argument has been neutralized, and uh, it's my understanding that the, the leader is, is um, you know, neutral on this, which is all we can ask. Uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, leadership is going to be okay um, if it does move through um, or if it is attached to, to a moving vehicle. And not only have we heard this from uh, our friends in the Senate on both sides of the aisle, but also in the House. And, you know, also specifically the Committee of Jurisdiction, which is Financial Services and Chairman McHenry. Uh, we've heard directly from him uh, on this, too. So uh, I think, you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, we still need to make sure that we can get a ride onto something that is definitely going to pass. Uh, but I feel better about the Safe Banking Act than I ever have in the six years I've been working on it. Wow. Uh, and, um, you know, we are going to continue to do our work at USCC. Uh, on the House side in particular, with Republicans in particular, uh, to elevate the conversation around safe and to really educate on the fact that, you know, this is a public safety issue. And Definitely. Uh, you're, you're in a legal state, like you need to take action on this. And then we can make sure that there are no more robberies and deaths associated with cannabis businesses. Um, we can stop that right now. Uh, so I think, I think we're, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. Great. Well, pretty good's about as good as we, we can get. And then so um, just one more question. Are you at all worried about the House being Republican controlled right now? No, 
Uh, and again, it's be it's really because we have done our homework uh, with uh, the Republican leaders, uh, not only you know from the speaker all the way down. And um, I, I think I think we're in a good spot. I mean, there was a lot of concern at the beginning of this Congress last year, as you may recall, uh, that a divided Congress was going to mean no reform. Um, but this package uh, is something that the House has passed in a bipartisan way so many times that even with some of the new leadership that that is in place right now, um, I still think that there's a, a comfort level um, to getting this done. Now, they may not jump up and down and, and uh, talk about how great the bill is, not everybody in leadership, but I do think that, uh, that you know, they're not going to object. Um, so I, yep. I, I don't think the divided Congress is an issue anymore as it's related to the Safe Banking Act. Now, um, other reform issues are probably a lot more dif uh, difficult for uh, conservatives to, to embrace, um, but this is a huge first step and it does pave the way quite nicely for us uh, to, to tackle additional reform issues in the next Congress. Yep, and I frankly think it's a necessary step um, to get the banking issues resolved before potential rescheduling happens as well. We expect that the industry is gonna um, grow tremendously from their cash flow profiles. These companies are gonna increase um, or improve tremendously as well. Banking has to be settled. Um, so it, it all makes logical sense. So, you know, Full disclaimer to everyone out there listening, this is not Miss Cleo. We don't have a crystal ball here. But David, if you had to guess, um, you know, your best guess, is this a March event? Is this an April event? How soon can this be attached to a bill? Sure. Um, I think that uh, we are going to have opportunities um, starting in March and uh, additional ones in both April and May. So, um, you know, late Q1, early Q2, I think there'll be a number of possibilities there. Uh, we're also gonna have a funding package most likely uh, that's coming down the pipe here. Um, so uh, I'd say there's four or five uh, uh, bills that we're gonna be watching very closely. Um, and we'll get, you know, once we get confirmation that the section 10 language has been sorted out, I expect to get that soon. Um, then I think we'll get some indication on what they try to hitch it to. And it's going to happen. Yep. I think it's going to happen very quickly. So um, my fingers are crossed that, uh, you know, before the end of Q2, uh, the State Banking Act is is uh, done and dusted. And obviously, this would be a, a really pivotal moment for the industry generally, as you know. Yep, absolutely. Um and I assume you don't view this mutually exclusive with rescheduling. No, I don't. Um, you know, I uh, one of the things, uh, the, one of the points I make in every single meeting that I have on the Safe Banking Act is that um, we are taught, we're talking about scheduling reform and where the administration we think is headed, but the the move down schedule, uh, if cannabis moves from schedule one down to three, let's say, which is where we think they're going to end up. Uh, that does not solve the issues that the Safe Banking Act does. So we still need to get that bill done. And um, I would very much like for Congress, if I had my way, uh, for them to move on it in Q1 or early Q2 and that piece of the puzzle uh, get done and signed into law before we get to Schedule 3. Do you think a combination of rescheduling down to three and safe banking um is kind of that one-two punch that we need to get more institutional participation in the asset class? Or does one solve for that better than the other? H how do you view that? Well, I, I'm optimistic that we're gonna get both. And I, I do think that we need both um, to, to, to get what you're suggesting. So um, the, the the move to schedule three, we discussed previously, um, has, will have an enormous impact in terms of the effective tax rate for these cannabis companies. So mm -hmm. those that are paying in the mid 70s or even 80% effective tax rate, uh, just the removal of 280E is going to bring that tax rate down to you know the low 20s. Um, and I think that's gonna be the, the most significant game changer. Um, the other really interesting thing around schedule three, and this has just been happening over the last few weeks is that uh, members of Congress on the conservative side are telling me that um, they're actually going to have a lot more comfort working and, and or voting yes on cannabis reform issues uh, when cannabis moves down to Schedule 3. And, sure. you know, you think about it uh, as a Schedule 1 drug, like, okay, I, I understand. Makes that. a lot of sense. 
it makes a lot of sense. I understand your concern. And while moving down to Schedule 3 is not going to make cannabis legal, um, it is, you know, equates it with Tylenol with codeine. And, yep. you know, there's just a lot less risk associated with it. So I, I do think that we're going to see some members that, uh, you know, have previously been adamantly opposed to cannabis reform issues uh, willing to work with us on things going forward. And, and that's that's really important for the audience to, to make note of because we get the kit, we get the safe banking bill done, we get the move down to Schedule 3. Um, cannabis is going to be much, much easier for members in legal states to work on than it ever has been. Yep, that's all super exciting. And then, you know, from our point of view as investors, as we think about just the general growth of the industry, you know, I think Colorado is a great example of a state where cannabis is so normalized. We've had recreational cannabis for the you know, better part of a decade here. Um, longer than a decade now, I guess. Um, the addressable market's much larger. Consumers are coming in because that stigma has gone away. I think rescheduling will actually help uh, many new consumers adopt using cannabis in different form factors, et cetera, as well. So um, benefits all along the way. So um, I think that's a good segue into just um, you know scheduling reform. We're talking about three. We've sent out a lot of literature. A lot of the folks that are tuned in here probably are receiving that, but what do you think about timing? What do you think about likelihood? Um, I think everyone recognizes this is largely an administration driven event. T tell me a little bit more about that and your expectations. Again, I know you don't have the, the crystal ball, but if you did, what, what would it say? Well, much to my wife's chagrin, I am a betting man. Uh, and I actually <laughs> put the, uh, I put the over under on this one, on May the 1st and uh, okay. this to be, done done and so let's just back up a little bit i think everybody in the audience follows uh what's going on here pretty closely but just as a reminder uh the health and human services um they were the first part of this process so they they spent a full year looking at the science and they went through their eight-step uh, program in order to make a, a recommendation and they um, recently released uh, the 252 pages um, of their recommendation, uh, completely unredacted, uh, which is great. And uh, if folks have not seen that yet, or if they haven't uh, read a summary of it, I strongly encourage you to do so because it's it's really powerful uh, language what they put out. But they did recommend Schedule Three, um, and you know if you go back and look at HHS's recommendation in terms of other drugs and where they should fall on schedule, the DEA has always 100% uh, followed their lead. Now. The Drug Enforcement Agency has to go through administration, sorry, they have to go through their own process, which they're doing now. And um, I think we're going to see something out of the agency sooner rather than later, um, you know, Q1, early Q2, that really makes their initial recommendation. And then, of course, they're going to have a public comment period. Um, and that could be, you know, anywhere from 60 to 90 days. But on the political side of the spectrum, which is what I'm trained to think about all day long every day. Um, we know that this is an issue. Cannabis is an issue generally that the president wants to run on. And one of the problem areas that he's got is young people. And what better way to mobilize uh, the youth vote than to work on cannabis reform issues and to really uh, talk about all of the um, the work that you put into it during your first term. And, and he has done a lot, uh, including scheduling reform. Um, there was a poll that uh, the Politico reported on um, uh, earlier this week uh, that shows Saw that. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it shows an 11 point swing, right? So mm -hmm. um, uh, it's significant. And the the Coalition for Scheduling Reform they've done a really good job uh, in terms of um, bringing the right pollsters to do this work. Uh, and they've also, you know, you could see in the the 252 page HHS doc, um, you know, it's very clear that a lot of the work that they put in. Um, to to this that the, this coalition put into scheduling uh, is is reflected in that document. So uh, you know, hat tip to them and and what they've been up to, um, because I think that we're really starting to see their work that they've they've been working on for the, you know for the last year. Um, so I think that by the summertime, um, hopefully we will have a uh, HHS will have you know made their final decision, and they are the final say in all of this. So. When the administrator says, you know, we've taken the public comments and this is where we're going to end up, that's it. It's it's over. Um, and the president can then take it and run on it as he's, uh, you know, gearing up for November. 
Um, and, you know, I think we're going to have as an industry a lot of questions around uh, the, the tax benefit and when does it begin? Um, because yep. for some of these companies, you know, it's such a big chunk that they're paying. You know, is it if it were to happen tomorrow, are we talking about can we go back to the beginning of January of 2024 or is it middle of the year or uh, you know, there's even discussion about this being retroactive? So, you know, if if the administration is suggesting that cannabis never should have been on schedule one, it should have always been on schedule three, then why should we not be looking back to the beginning sure. of some of these companies? And I think that's going to be a really interesting discussion that we have after this lands. Yep. My, uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the, the red tax implications. My, my guess as a betting man myself, too, is that that's probably going to be more difficult, but there will be lawsuits. And I know that there's already a lot of talk about, about that. And frankly, a lot of folks that just haven't paid their taxes, but we'll, uh, we'll save that for a different podcast. <laughs> um, as far, you know, now, now these are going to be kind of a little bit more speculative questions. Sure. Um, and, then, and then I think we can wrap things up. The DEA makes this announcement that they agree with HHS for Schedule 3 and you go into this comment period. My guess is that the markets start to move immediately, but that you probably don't really get that sustained kind of long-term um, uh, volume institutional participation until the comment period is, is quite obviously over. What, what are your thoughts around there? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you you know the markets uh, a lot better than I do, um, but I do think that uh, investors are a lot more cautious than they were five or six years ago, um, and they're going to wait. Uh, there's going to be some movement. So, like you said, is if DEA comes out tomorrow or next week and makes you know their initial recommendation that it goes that it's going to move it, that it should be moved down to Schedule Three, I do think we will see uh, a, a reaction, a good one, um, but. I think a lot of folks are going to wait until this is actually finalized, that she has signed, uh, and that it's done um, before they, you know, really decide to to get involved. Uh, that that that's my gut. So we are we are in complete agreement there. Yep. So market movement to begin with, probably driven a lot by retail, like we've seen in the past, and then once this is finally done, I think you see that kind of sustained um, institutional participation, and then I guess that that kind of leads me to the next question. I do think that safe or rescheduling one or the other is likely enough to get some of those institutions that are sitting on, you know, the edge of the diving board to jump in. Um, I think the combo of you gets those that are maybe a little bit more cautious to start getting more involved. Um, what are your thoughts around, um, you know, potential for access to U.S. capital markets via the public exchanges? I know we've talked about the CLIMB Act in the past, but does rescheduling plus safe banking maybe give us the, uh, um, you know, what we need in order to get the NASDAQ on board or in order to get, you know, these payment processors like the visas, the MasterCards, when does, what does it take to get this industry really into um, a normal operating place like any other business outside of cannabis? Yeah, so the it, in, short answer is in my opinion, no. Uh, so the Safe Banking Act has written um, even when combined with Schedule 3, I would still say that my answer is no. Now, there is a lot of speculation still that... No on specifically the exchanges or no on also like the payment processors? Both. Okay. I, I think there's a lot of discussion right now about... Um, we haven't seen the final language of the Safe Banking Act. So, you know, the Senate... The House has their version as introduced. The Senate has theirs that they uh, moved out of committee, which is the safer. It's got an R in the end. Maybe mm -hmm. at the end of the day, is this thing is the safest banking act of all time. <laughs> uh, maybe that's how they at the end. But either way, um, we haven't seen the final version yet. And there may be pieces of the CLIMB Act that are included in this state banking act. And then your question uh, is something that we need to reassess, right, to see kind of what they what they do. Um, I will also say that if the Banking Act passes as introduced currently, right, um, I think that this really is going to open up additional discussion um, around, again, all the bells and whistles of the CLIMB Act. Uh, and I think it's yep. going to be a lot easier for members uh, to talk about this. So uh, going back to my original um, point about these members and Schedule 3, um, you know, if we say, listen, we were able to provide safe harbor for the banks, 
right? So we should be thinking about this much broader in terms of other financial services that are key to the industry. And I think the appetite uh, for members is going to be much better than it is currently if cannabis is on schedule three. So um, if the bill comes out and it's it's a skinny version or the original version or whatever you want to call it, uh, I'd say we've got a lot of work left to do uh, in terms mm -hmm. of markets. Um, but I think that that work is going to be easier for us to do um, in the future just because schedule three is going to, you know, basically make it easier for a lot of conservatives to, to work on these issues. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's, that's highly logical. Um, and I think it makes a ton of sense now, whether or not our politicians are highly logical, I, I think is uh, yet to be determined. Um, but okay. nonetheless, super, super insightful, David. Um, I can feel the optimism. I can tell you that we definitely share the optimism um, amongst ourselves, even amongst our investors. I think folks see that 2024 is going to be a year of big change for the industry. Um, we're sitting here eagerly waiting. I'm hoping that it happens sooner than later. I, I love the timelines that you discussed. Um, but nonetheless, to everybody out there listening, you know, wear your investor hat, focus on the fundamentals regardless. Um, you don't want to be caught um, surprised if things don't happen the way you thought they were and, and focusing on a business that actually has a strong balance sheet, good P&L, good management is always the best way. Um, to invest and, and reduce that risk. Um, but David, thank you so much for spending some time with, with me here again today. Um, hopefully we can have you back on in a few months and we can be cheering some positive news here. I hope so. Always great to be with you. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.